welcome to the second in our series of Aftershocks and Opportunities webinars. And uh, we have a number of exciting panelists for you today. We have Leah Rincon from UBI Europe. We have Anne Boyson from After the Millennials and David Wood from London Futurist. And they'll all introduce themselves in a second. Uh, I want to apologize up front. There's some background noise. Uh, from my machine, which we thought would have been replaced by today, but it arrived too late to be used. We have a remote mic and I will be muting myself as much as possible. Uh, could I ask everyone uh, who is attending to put your comments in the comments column and any questions you have for the panelists, please put those in the Q&A box. Uh, we also, last time, we had a number of people offering to promote their own services and events and activities in the comments section. Uh, I'm fine with that, but uh, the most feedback I got from any of the people responding was that they didn't like it. So it's up to you uh, whether you do that or not, but just understand that some people may not see that as appropriate. Uh, but I'm really going to open up now. Let's, let's get the, the seminar going. What we can see is that we're in the middle of an incredible and unprecedented crisis for most of humanity. We're trying right now to work out how to navigate through just the day to day of the crisis. But at the same time, we're also trying to understand what could this all mean? How will we come out of this? What will the next few months look like? And what could the next few years look like? And in particular, what does all this mean for humanity? What are the implications? What are the opportunities? How might this impact the relationship between different generations when we see conversations going on about, you know, how the young and the old might be treated very differently in a post pandemic world. We see huge conversations about how do we deal with the potential levels of unemployment that we see right now, but also what might follow as businesses fail following the return to work. Uh, and we're also seeing the conversation about whether things like guaranteed minimum incomes or guaranteed basic incomes might be the way forward. And then we're looking at the whole conversation around how do we provide humanity with greater resilience to be able to cope with future health and environmental shocks. And so these are some of the topics we're going to be looking at. And we're also going to be exploring what this could mean in terms of how we as individuals, we as organizations, and we as nations try to prepare for what's next. And what are some of those policy challenges and personal challenges that we need to really be setting ourselves uh, in the right position to be able to respond to those. So with that, I'm now going to hand over to each of the panelists in turn to just take 15 seconds to introduce themselves. So. David, if you could start with just a, a short 15 second introduction to who you are and what you do. Thank you, Rohit. My name's David Wood. I chair London Futurists. And my background includes a period of time as a mathematician, another period of time as a philosopher of science, and 25 years in the mobile computing and smartphone industry. Excellent. Um, David Wor Wortley, could I ask if you sort of mute your screen now? So we've got the panelists. We don't, uh, I think you can glide into the background gracefully. Um, okay, Anne, would you like to introduce yourself as well? Yes, thank you so much for having me here. My name is Anne Boyson. I uh, run a consultancy called After the Millennials, uh, which I started uh, almost 10 years ago uh, to actually in many ways to as in the aftermath of the last recession because i'm interested in how we can view change and how we view uh how to build a new future through the lens of generational change particularly with a an eye to the uh youngest generation and that what we often call generation z excellent welcome and finally we have lea rincon from UBI Europe. Leah, would you like to just tell us a little about yourself? Yes, well first of all thank you Rohit for organizing the webinar and uh, for inviting us to participate. 
Um, as you said, I am a member of Unconditional Basic Income Europe and this year's elected chair. Um, we as an organization are a non-for-profit organization which advocates for uh, basic income policy and for fostering the debate. Um, and also currently at the moment, I'm also working on basic income um, in my PhD thesis, um, which I'm developing here at the University of Barcelona. Great, and Leah, let's stay with you. Let's, um, let's start with just a couple of minutes of thoughts of you, from you about the broader issue uh, that we're looking at now around Humanity Next. What, what do you see as some of the, the big opportunities, challenges, risks around helping humanity navigate our way beyond the crisis? Was that for me? That, that was for Leah. Well, um, so when I think of this crisis, um, of, of this coronavirus crisis, I see this as a crisis that has no um, geographical or economic borders. You know, poor and rich people have been uh, contagious and died like. Um, our frontiers have actually not prevented a global contagion. And to me, this has shown that we are much more interdependent than we thought we were, and we are much more vulnerable to others' vulnerability than we otherwise thought. But I think there's a positive thing now, and this crisis has shown that we're capable and actually willing of halting our economies if this is the only way of saving human lives. Now, to me, the question and the challenge is whether we're capable um, and ready, prepared to do so in the long run. I think um, this would require a radical paradigm shift um, in the way we structure our economies and we think our societies. And this means, you know, stop uh, working for the economy and make the economy work to sustain human life. This means reconsidering um, the work that we consider the most valuable to our existence and then valuing uh, this work in a meaningful way. I think the old solutions that we, that we had on the table and that we're still thinking about will not save us. I think our survival requires adaption and flexibility. And in the current context, to me, survival looks like um, global cooperation, investment in health, research in science, and of course, uh, as I will be discussing later, uh, global safety nets. That will be the basis of a strong um, and sustainable recovery. Now, in this sense, what I think is that the challenge is not so much developing a vaccine or preventing a worse economic crisis, but actually the challenge is how we do this and whether we take this opportunity to transform the underpinnings that, um, of the workings of our society and our, and our economies. Now, I think we have a big opportunity here because for once we have the knowledge and the resources at our disposal to tackle this crisis. And, you know, the negative outcomes that we are kind of predicting are not inevitable. Um, the only ingredients that we're missing now are the willingness to, global, uh, to cooperate at a global level and a change in our priorities. But I think that if we're able to do this, um, we will come out stronger from this crisis. But in the meantime, however, I see that the biggest challenge um, is going to be uh, changing norms in, 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 our global, um, uh, in our global relations. Excellent, thank you. Uh, let's put the same question to Anne. Um, what, is, what is your kind of first two minutes of thoughts on, uh, or what are your first two minutes of thoughts on how this all plays out for humanity and what, you know, what are some of the biggest opportunities or challenges that we face here? So I, I agree very much with uh, Lara that this is far more than just uh, sort of the practical issue of finding vaccines, finding cures, uh, even, even forecasting whether we're going to have a second or a third wave. It's the way in which we approach the problem. And not only how we, we approach it, but how we frame it. What, what is the framing of this problem? Is this symptomatic of a much deeper, larger issue? Or do we treat it as, a, as an ad hoc event that we need to fix right now? And then, and then we leave everything else um, uh, the way it was, if we view it as a status quo. So I, read, uh, I, I view that very much in the same vein. Um, and I think it's in order to get that um, multilateral, uh, international, global, cross-generational uh, uh, response, a un, 
unitary response to it, it's going to be very important that every stakeholder feels heard. Because if we, if we treat it basically just like a, this, is a, this is a virus, this is a, a pandemic, and that's all it is, then we're not going to get the buy-in, if you want to call it that. You, you're not going to get the same willingness to make the sacrifices to, to resolve it. I totally agree that we're definitely at that point where so much of the focus is on the issue itself, the pandemic and the, the, the possible waves. And as you say, can, can we uh, find a vaccine? But we do really have to think about what does this all look like after this? And, and how do we think about the new structures of society where society is so different uh, from place to place and the needs are so different today? let alone what those needs might be when we look a year or two years out. Uh, so let's take our third panelist's two minute perspective on this. David, what are your thoughts here? So I'd like to start by looking back in order that we can look forward more wisely. Let's remember what happened after the, another recent global crisis where I'm referring not to the current case of biological contagion, but to the financial contagion of the global financial crisis of 2008. Shortly after that, Queen Elizabeth II, no less, was invited to open a new building at the London School of Economics. And in front of a large crowd of distinguished economists, she asked why no one had predicted the crisis. After a bit of a delay, the group of professors wrote back to the Queen. Their answers have important lessons for us now, I think, in 2020, just as much as when the letter was first written. They identified three issues, a feel-good factor, which masked how out of kilter the world economy had come, had become beneath the surface, a psychology of denial that gripped the financial and political world, and an overtrust in financial wizards who managed to convince themselves and the world's politicians that they had found clever ways to spread risk throughout financial markets. So my hope for what comes out of the COVID crisis will be a clearer, more sober understanding of the precariousness and uncertainty of the future well-being of humanity. We cannot continue to let ourselves be misled by feel-good factors, pleasant though they are, the psychology of denial, reassuring for that seems, or overtrust in smooth talking leaders. If we continue to be misled, I fear that the trauma of the COVID crisis will be as nothing compared to the larger upheavals that I predict lie ahead. But if we do take this shock to become wiser, we can use the same forthcoming transformational forces to reach not a world that is far worse than today's, but one that is far better. Thank you. Uh, great thoughts there. And, and I think this issue of the feel good factor and people almost not wanting to think too deeply about what might happen next is really one of the biggest challenges we have to deal with. I, I so often find myself in conversations with people who say, well, I just don't want to think about that. Can't we just deal with the current crisis? But actually, the roots of the next crisis lie exactly in the way we choose to tackle what's happening today. Okay, so we've had some opening thoughts from the panel. I see that there's, there's questions flying in, comments flying in. You're gonna to have to forgive us as panel members that our ability to read the questions, read the comments and listen to each other is, is, uh, you know, is a challenge. So we have got people in the background feeding us some of the most interesting questions coming through. What we're now going to do is to have three rounds of conversation. I'm going to talk to Anne first, then Lair and David individually. And we'll spend about 15 minutes with each panelist talking about one particular area. And I'm gonna start with Anne talking about the generational issue. Then with Lair, we're going to talk about uh, unemployment and UBI. And then with David, this issue about enhancing human resilience and the, the notion of whether we can engineer better humans. So let's, let's start with Anne. Uh, if we may. Let's get Anne back on screen. Anne, so you're a generational expert. Um, I've followed you for years and been fascinated by 
uh, both the data-driven and the human behavioral insights that you generate about generations and their differences, but also what brings them together. So perhaps you could start us off with just sharing some thoughts about what was already going on around generations and generational differences, and how is that now manifesting itself in the way we talk about the current crisis and the way we get out of it? Yes, so I think, uh, you know, again, I think it's very important to not look at this as an isolated event. Uh, how the, the, the sort of the baseline of when this, this crisis hit us uh, is going to have an impact on what we do the next six months, 12 months, 18 months. And what we do for the next few months is going to, to lay the foundation of how it's going to set so many uh, it's going to set a precedence for, for, for how we deal with crisis in the future. So there's one way of looking at this uh, crisis that everything was fine and dandy. You know, uh, in mid-February, the stock markets hit an all-time high again uh, after, you know, 11 years of a bull market, unemployment, very low. Things looked like everything was, was fine. There was not a problem here. Um, now, there were many analysts who saw some dark clouds rolling in on the horizon, which could indicate that things weren't as um, Pollyanna-ish as we could, we could uh, imagine. So, you know, just, just to start with the economy, the productivity, global productivity had already started to, to stagnate. The debt to GDP ratio is beyond any sort of safe uh, limits. I, I think World Bank says that if you're over 77%, you're in big trouble and you're going to have some slowdown and possibly even a, a full default on your economy. So you had that going on. You had uh, widening, very widening income inequality. And this is something that I've been following from the last recession, that there's this appearance of a very, you know, well economy going, going well and then and then the, what how people actually feel about it is very different and that has to do with how you measure it if you compare average income or just total income uh, yes it might look good but if you actually look at the median income or median debt level of, of different people uh it's a, you, you you get a little bit of a different uh, situation or different story there now this has been framed as a generational issue so it's very important to remember that that there's been a perception of you know, young people feeling that they don't have the same opportunity as older people, that there's been like this hoarding of wealth at the top. That is the truth with very big modifications because again, if you look, it's how you look at the metrics. So, you know, if you're mortgage up to the eyeballs, you, you don't necessarily have a lot more. It's, you know, you have young people have not having had the chance to buy as much assets, for example. Okay, so, so can, can, we, can we now sort of take it into the context of the actual current crisis? Because we, we have a limited yeah, amount of yes. time. And I could listen to you for forever, but <laughs> you know, we, we have a limited amount of time. So, so let's take it now into the context of the current crisis. How do you see those generational differences playing out now and in the, in the coming couple of years in relation to the crisis? What, what, what are we likely to see or what do you believe we might be seeing? Well, so I, way, I, I sorry, just um, for the people making comments, when you make your comments, can you select the option of sending it to everyone? Because a lot of you are sending your comments just to the panelists. And, and I think a lot of the comments look like they're very interesting. So why don't you share them with everyone? Again, I think this can be seen, this, this crisis that we have now can also be seen as a, as a as it's falling into a generational pattern, because it's a crisis that affects the older generations more than younger, just, just by the fact that you're more receptive to complications. The way it affects younger generations more is uh, 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 the secondary effects of it, because they're more likely to have service jobs, they're more likely to be uh, you know, on the front lines of, of layoffs. Today, you know, it was like 20, by now we've had 22 million uh, people seeking unemployment benefits, I think, or something like that. So we're looking at a huge recession ahead of it. And that's why I'm bringing this economic uh, um, factor, because I think that's going to determine whether, if you have the perception that we're just going to get out of this quickly and get back to normal, or whether we're going to have this more L-shaped recovery. Um, so 
the other crisis, very easy to forget the other crisis that we had about a year ago that we talked about, which was a global crisis, and that is climate change. And so there's, if for younger people today, very quickly, we get this, this, this optics that if we only solve this crisis and we fail to recognize the full picture, the economic aspect of it, the, uh, the inequality aspect of it, the, uh, uh, and the aspects of the fact that we're going to, to get more pandemics in the future by, 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 by the virtue of climate change itself and an, an unresolved problem. Uh, they're not going to have the same stakes and and they might not have the same willingness to to to, to make these long-term efforts into to getting out of this crisis um and again this is a crisis that uh that, that requires everybody to cooperate the interesting fact is that we 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 haven't had this polarization uh since you know maybe the 30s so this is unprecedented in many ways we have to now cooperate on a level that we're not set up to be able to do. So again, uh, how I can't really predict how we're going to get out of this. I can't really predict, you know, how uh, the generational constellation is going to look like in five years from now in a post COVID future, but we're laying the foundations now. So it's, it's very much the optics of how we frame this situation now, where we're going to have a fundamental systemic approach to problem so, uh, resolution, or if it's going to be looked at as just a um, a, a one-off of the went. Um, okay. I also want. Let me give you my my third question then. So, already we see in the conversations about people's policies around the return to work and the ending of lockdowns, you're seeing some countries talking about the idea of letting the young and the fit out first, and keeping the old and the infirm and people with uh, conditions of concern, if you like, back at home. That, that clearly creates the potential for all sorts of generational conflicts. Given that this is likely to happen, what can we do to, to try and prevent the worst of those conflicts manifesting themselves? <laughs> That's a big million dollar question, right? <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, it, honestly, I, it's, I don't know. Because again, um, I think that you, you have some very interesting um, new alliance partners here. Because typically what we've seen very recently here in the United States, is, at least, and, um, uh, is that young people are rallying around more leftist policies. And, and what you also see is that the, uh, the more leftist branch of the spectrum is more risk averse and it's more less willing to take chances with this virus itself. It's typically when you when you see the the um, uh, the 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 reluctance to go into shutdowns and lockdowns. It's typically on the right, and you also see a little bit of that among younger people. At least there's a there's a objective interest for them to get back to work quicker. So you have this very strange realignment of interests. And stakeholder interests. Um, so how that plays out is is a little bit of an open question. But I think that again, it's how the the how we frame the problem. Are we framing this problem as a as a global problem, a, a sustainability problem, a, a problem that we can resolve if we make the right strategic and tactical changes right now. For example, on the one hand, we have young people who are uh, more likely to serve in these jobs that where they can have layoffs. But on the other hand, they also are the most well equipped to jump over to this next paradigm shift that uh, Larry was talking about. We need a new paradigm shift, even right. in the economy, even in in workplaces. Okay, what are I they to end us there because of, just of time, but um, fascinating point. Um, David, can we get up the f the polling question that we had for Anne? So we, uh, people seem to like the polling questions last time, so we're going to do one after each panelist. Can we get up the polling question that Anne gave us? So if you could all review and uh, cast your votes quickly, then Anne will give us some reflections on it. Can we keep the polling question on screen, please, David?
Okay, let's get the, uh, the answers up. The, the trick, everyone, is to vote quickly. David, can we get the answers up on screen, please? Um, well, they're still coming in, Rohit. They're still coming in. We've had 76, uh, 78. Just show uh, us the results we've got now. I was going to say the results now. Okay, I'm going to share the results now. So, Anne, do you want to give us uh, some quick reflections on, on the results that you see up on screen here? Well, uh, it seems that this uh, V-shaped recovery that uh, it seems to be the baseline scenario uh, in, among, at least in, in mainstream media, does, has the least amount of supporters. So I think that many people are seeing this as a more systemic issue, or at least an indication that um, we need a more, more systemic, a more systemic approach to it, or, or look at this as a forewarning of what's, what might be coming next, so that we need to uh, fundamentally shift our, how we are structuring our economy, how we're structuring our relationship with nature around us, et cetera. Uh, just the, so the the red is that that that's yeah that's obviously um, the one that is getting the most results. So almost fifty percent of the pan, of the respondents um, believe that this yeah the the virus will set a uh, precedence for how we solve more complex environmental issues. And and again, I don't think it's because this is tied to environmental change, but I think that it sets the path forward because. The, if we can't solve this, how are we going to be able to solve far more complex issues that are going to have global impacts similar to what we're dealing with right now? And it seems like that is um, what a lot of people are having a consensus around. Okay, we don't seem to have any direct questions for you from the audience about the generational issue. So what I'm gonna do is bring in Lair and then David to just share your thoughts on the, both the question that we just posed in the, in the poll, but also your general reflections on, if you like, generations in society as we come out of the crisis. There, perhaps you could start us off with some initial... Yeah, sure. Um, so it struck me that one of uh, the second most popular option here in the poll was the gradual opening up of society and, and you know, going back to work, looking for new jobs and so on. Um, I think it had like 30% of votes for that option. And it strikes me that um, we tend to think that, there, that we're going to go back to normality and that there is a normality uh, to go back to. Um, but the truth is that we really don't know uh, what the impact is going to be on employment. Like we don't know how much employment is going to be permanently lost and how the current employment is going to be transformed because this will have an effect. The lockdowns will have an effect on how we structure our employment. And I thought the, the point that Anne raised in terms of how we're going to solve this, this crisis, are we going to have a, a broader frame? Are we going to solve it from a systemic point of view? Um, precisely because we're coming, we're carrying over other crises um, to this current crisis. So we, we were already thinking about an unemployment crisis due to automation and so on. And this crisis is going to be carried over to this other crisis. So um, it strikes me that we still think uh, that we're going to, to go back to a normality. And I think that will be very important to, to try and, and open up a bit our minds and think that uh, maybe there is no such thing as a normality and that we should rethink how we uh, consider employment and work in our societies. Great, well, it's a, two great uh, points to bring you in on there, David. Firstly, are we talking about going back to something? And secondly, whether we are or not, is what we're moving towards a new normal or, or is chaos the, the, the new normal going forward? Well, I don't want to go back either to what we've had in the past. I don't have any illusions that life in the 1950s or the 1970s or the 2010s were in some sense uh, dis uh, truly desirable. So I'm looking to humanity to have a moment, of, a dark night of the soul, if you like, and to help us to figure out that some things are much more important than we used to consider. 
the people who we applaud, the people who we consider to be the critical workers, are typically the ones that we're not giving much salary to currently. They are the hospital porters, the cleaners, the transport workers, the nurses. And in many ways, although I have to say the city financiers and advertising executives, they do some useful work in society. I think society as a whole is going to come to a view that actually these other people who have astronomically high salaries aren't desi deserving of such a differential. But getting to there from here is going to have quite a lot of chaos. Things in some ways will probably get worse before they get better. In part, it's because the lockdown is still at a comparatively early phase. Although thankfully, in at least some countries, the death rate and the infection rate seems to be stabilizing. We can't let things go back to an unlockdown state too quickly. Otherwise, we'll have a, another terrible wave of the disease. And after all, if we look at previous pandemics, such as the 1918 pandemic, the first wave was bad. The second wave was truly awful with many more people being killed later in the year than in the first wave in March of 18, 1918. So we're going to need all the help we can to manage through this time of chaos and where there are divisions between generations, as I think may be exacerbated, as well as many other divisions as the lockdown proceeds, we're going to need to draw upon the best of human nature to patch over these potential sore points. Will we get to a we generation instead of a me generation, as Reza Jafari was asking in the chat? Uh, it's still an open question, because although we have a tendency to collaborate, we still have some very nasty tendencies inside human nature too, which is causing us to scapegoat each other and to blame each other and to get hostile with each other if we're not careful. Thank you, David. And do you want to, uh, do you have any final thoughts on the generational topic before we move on to the, the next conversation? Uh, no, I, I'm, I'm reading the comments coming in. I think it's interesting. Uh, Again, I, and I agree with this, you know, there's been a lot of throwing back and forth, me generation, we generation. Uh, you typically hear the, you know, millennials talking about boomers being the me generation and the other way around. So yeah, it's, you can definitely fall down a rabbit hole there and, and follow. If you only read the headlines, it seems as if we're far more divided than we really are. Uh, I think a lot of what is viewed through the lens of generational conflict really is not. Uh, it's more, there, there are other factors uh, involved, um, but, but it's an easy peg. It's easy to say, okay, it's this group against this group. However, what I'm talking about is that, is that in the long run, if we see that there's a lot of young people who are not getting an opportunity, as we move further and further into the crisis, there could be some potential for some real conflict because it's, it's so reflective of of the reality that people are living in the moment. So, uh, so again, it's a little bit of an open, uh, open scenario. Um, the, I think that the only way to reduce it is to make sure that all stakeholders are, are, are heard, whether that's generation, uh, you know, along a generational continuum or if it's uh, along other sort of divisors. Thank you, Anne. thank you very much. Okay, so in the interest of time, we're now going to move on to Leo Rincon who's going to talk to us about the UBI issue. And I guess where I'd ask you to start, uh, Leah, is, um, is, is really to talk to us about, you know, what do you see UBI as being? Because there are so many different definitions out there. Uh, and what is it not, given the example of what we're talking about with Spain? And what benefits do you think it could bring to a post-COVID-19 world? Okay, um, so first of all, thank you for, for starting with the definition uh, question because uh, it's something that it's um, in the current, uh, well, we saw this before, but in the current uh, coronavirus crisis, we're seeing um, how we people are getting uh, definition mixed up. So just to start with, a universal basic income is a policy proposal at the moment, so we haven't seen it implemented uh, anywhere in the world yet, so it's a policy proposal, which contends that every individual should receive um, a uh, periodic income cash payment without any sort of means test, without behavioral requirements, and this would be regardless of uh, working uh, or socioeconomic status. Um, so basically, and this should be enough to cover basic living standards. Now. Um, 
bringing a, Anne's issue of framing, uh, we should not understand basic income simply as welfare, but actually as basic security in a, in a world in which we have commodified our living essentials. So in essence, basically um, as a right to material existence. Now, uh, we usually get confused basic income with other policies like negative uh, income taxes, like minimum incomes, minimum wages, and so on. But these are very different policies because uh, these policies are targeted, they're conditional in some ways, so they don't fulfill with the basic income definition. The same thing happens with uh, pilot projects around the globe. Um, and not one country has actually experimented with a pure version of UBI. So we actually have no test. And this is the same, as I said, with, uh, with the current policy discussions that we're seeing in the coronavirus crisis. Um, we see it in Spain, we've seen it in the US and in Canada. These countries are discussing about different um, cash benefits, which are very, very far from a UBI because once more they are conditional and targeted in different ways. Now, I think that the, the basic income has various um, uh, comparative advantages in comparison to these other policies. And I think this is the most appropriate scheme for the current economic crisis, basically because we have a clear demand shock and because we have a lot of uncertainty. So actually, um, UBI is the perfect recipe for these um, uh, two obstacles. First, because it gets money directly into people's pockets, so this would boost the demand. This would enable to continue a longer period of lockdown if it is necessary. But if this is not necessary, it will adapt. So it will enable adaptation to labor market changes and economic changes in a much more flexible way. And actually reducing costs because it's a very simple instrument that you know we we could reduce the administrative burden and administrative complexity of the current welfare state, and we could reduce the current costs. Of course, without incurring you know stigma and further depressing our population, like um, what could happen if we actually went down the other road, so the targeted and conditional road. Fabulous. So so you've you've, you've argued your case there for UBI. What do you see as some of the implementation challenges around actually delivering this in different countries around the world, given the very different levels of financial stability and resource that different nations have? How do, how do we fund it? How do we make it happen? And how long would it take to actually put in place such a scheme in different parts of the world? Okay. Um... I don't know how long it would take to, to implement, but I don't think we have to consider the financial feasibility uh, a big issue for the implementation of a basic income. Um, basically because um, we have seen, you know, there's already various studies on the table, which prove that actually the numbers work out. But we also know that, that we have huge amounts of wealth and that actually wealth is increasing at the global scale. So actually the question is whether and how we redistribute this wealth. And this is more of a political than an economic um, questions. But I think that if we're going to speak about um, the financial feasibility in terms of a challenge, we should also speak about how um, a, a UBI could save us a lot of costs. Now, I already spoke about, for example, the, the associated cost with, you know, the whole um, administration of the, of the welfare state and so on. We could reduce uh, these costs having a basic income. But basic income could also reduce a lot of costs in policies and areas in which we would have not expected, uh, like, for example, health. Um, one of the things that we learned from the MINCOM project, pilot project in Canada, um, was that people actually attended a lot less hospitals and doctors. So in the long run, um, UBI could actually reduce costs in other, in other areas. Um, I also think that uh, it has this cost-effective potential because if we gave every individual a uh, basic income, we could ensure that, um, you know, private public policy, uh, private um, public policies and public investment is really uh, taken up by the population in, effective, in an effective way. So let's, for example, uh, think of for, uh, education. Um, if we provided a safety net to everyone, we could ensure that everyone would have um, the same opportunities to educate themselves, to retrain themselves appropriately. And so we could um, you know, take more advantage of these uh, kind of policies that we are already investing in. The same goes for gender equality, actually. 
we we make huge investments in in gender equality and and trying to combat gender violence and so on but we could really boost these efforts if we had a, a universal basic income and this we saw for example in the Bemincom project uh here in barcelona which had a huge uh liberating effect on women uh, by giving them financial independence from their uh from their partners so in essence i think that um, financial feasibility is not uh, an, an implementation challenge at all. I think uh, UBI has more of a, you know, cost saving potential than simply costs. And I would think that usually in normal situations, this is very desirable, but seeing the magnitude of the economic crisis that that we are going to be living and that we're going to be uh, going through, I think that, uh, you know, the cost of implementing a UBI is a lot lower than the cost of uh, actually not doing anything and, and following the status quo. Okay, great. And, and um, this leads me nicely to my third question and my, my final question, which is whenever we start the conversation about UBI here in the UK, very quickly people start to say, well, what is the point of giving a UBI to someone who's earning 100,000 or why would you give it to, uh, you know, mm -hmm. Rick Branson or Sir Philip Green when they're billionaires? You know, what's your argument around why, you know, why we would give it to everyone rather than be more selective? Yes. Well, I think this is one of my favorite counter arguments because uh, to me, it is striking that um, we always worry about giving more money to the rich uh, in a discussion of a policy that actually the only intention is to cover only really minimal and basic needs. Um, and this happens in a time, you know, when we're pouring millions uh, to the rich already through um, um, tax, uh, through company subsidies, uh, tax deduction, fiscal heavens, inheritance, the lack of a maximum wage. So, uh, you know, people worry about giving more to the rich when we're actually pouring a lot more than, than we think we are. So I think that these arguments, and, and these arguments basically come from, uh, you know, a, a, a strategy to delegitimize UBI uh, instead of a true concern uh, to actually, uh, you know, redistribute uh, and redistribute wealth accumulation. But the truth is that um, the potential uh, of UBI and what makes UBI truly effective is that this is given to everyone. And yes, this includes uh, rich people. This is actually something that's called redi the redistribution paradox um, in academia, which is basically the idea that when you give uh, money to everyone, this is a lot more effective for those who are worst off than actually targeting policies to lower incomes. And this is basically because conditional and targeted policies uh, create dependencies. And they create disincentives to kind of develop and engage again in the labor market. And they, call, uh, they, they generate the so-called unemployment and poverty traps. Uh, and also they generate a lot of stigma for the recipients, which is also not effective uh, for them you know, to develop. So, Basically, the, the effectiveness of UBI lies in giving this policy to everyone, including the rich. Of course, nobody is arguing that we have to give more money to the rich because actually most of us who defend uh, a universal basic income, we also defend more progressive forms uh, of taxation and we defend progressive forms of funding this policy, like for example, uh, taxing income uh, in so taxing wealth instead of income, taxing capital instead of labor, and actually use uh, universal basic income as a way to redistribute wealth uh, more effectively. All right, I, I can't let that carry on because you were actually answering a lot of the questions that were coming in as you were talking. But let's, uh, let's go now to uh, your poll question. Uh, David Wortley, could we get the next poll question up on screen, please? And uh, to the participants, uh, we're going to give you 45 seconds to cast your vote on this one. Okay, David Wortley, can we get the votes up on screen, please? It's 
So Lyra, would you like to comment on that? Yes. Um, so the first thing is that the answers are quite evenly distributed around um, around the different options, uh, which is quite striking because usually people tend to focus on on one. So I guess that the most popular answer is actually the one which um, which I think has given um, a lot of attention to universal basic income. So since uh, now we're having a lot of attention to this policy because of the uh, of the coronavirus crisis and the subsequent economic crisis that, uh, that we're going to see. But actually, there was a lot of attention to basic income before this, um, when the prospects of automating labor uh, were becoming more and more uh, real. So I think this, um, is what we see in the poll that actually this is one of the reasons why uh, you know people would think that this policy is um, is legitimate. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to give you one of the questions that's come in from the uh, the, um, the participants, which is around the idea of uh, whether we need some sort of universal basic income facility, um, which was. Um, under the auspices of the UN, because we know how popular that is at the moment. Um, and if so, how would it be adjusted to around things like purchasing power parity and how would it be funded? Do you, do you see that we have to have a universal mechanism for this? So um, it would be interesting uh, to have a universal mechanism for this and maybe get basic income at the global uh, scale. Uh, in terms of the funding uh, capability, I mean, there, there are a lot of very different strategies uh, to fund this. And, it, and I find this question very interesting because usually we focus at the national level mechanisms of funding a policy. And then, and then is when we hear, you know, these arguments that what about uh, poorer countries, countries which don't have uh, so many resources, but actually thinking at the global level, um, we broaden up uh, the, the possibilities for funding and we actually open up, uh, you know, to a lot more wealth. And I think here, um, one of the most popular funding uh, proposals in this sense could be an interbank uh, transaction tax, for example. And there are some studies which show that with a very, very small uh, interbank transaction tax, which wouldn't even be between people. Obviously, it would be between, uh, you know, financial entity transactions, and it would be very, very small. You, you could fund a global basic income. So I think that the possibilities are there, and it's just a matter of making them happen. Fantastic. I already, just having listened to you and Anne speak, I'm convinced that we need to bring you back for one-on-one -on -one interviews to go much deeper into your individual topics. Um, but uh, those who know me know I love to pack in way too much into any one of these events. Uh, I'm going to bring in Anne and then David just to see if you've got any comments that you want to make around this, this topic of UBI. Anne, first. You're muted, Anne. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, no, it's very fascinating. I've, I've heard various variations of... Um, of universal basic income. I, uh, I'm actually surprised. I thought this was tried out in, in smaller communities and jurisdictions. Um, I, I definitely think that's what, what we're trying now. There's a lot of different policies that have sort of been in the, uh, in the idea sphere for such a long time that we are now forced to try, whether it's universal basic income, whether it's, um, reducing our, our footprints on the world in general. Everything was said a year ago that we weren't able to do, we're actually doing at the moment. So this, again, that's why I think that how we, how we are approaching the problem now and what the, the, the steps that we're taking now and the, the reactions and the, uh, the effects of it are, is going to uh, kind of be important as we move forward. Uh, but I, I don't, I, I'm, I'm excited to see whether that's going to actually win some, some more support, uh, some more um, interest now in this climate. Okay, and to David Wood. 
So there's a short-term issue. A question for you, though, as part of this, what Subhash Shukla has just said, does this have to come in as part of a package of measures that includes things like taxation increases or taxation policy changes? Uh, your 60 seconds on this, David. So there's a short-term and a long-term angle to universal basic income. I think it would be the case. If we had basic income already in place, it would have been much easier for many people to go into the lockdown. Many businesses have gone through great traumas. People are shutting down their businesses. Probably if the schemes were already there, this wouldn't have been anything like as dramatic. But I want to look at the longer term. I see universal basic income as part of what could be a much better way for humanity to operate longer term. For most of history, we've operated under what's sometimes called the Protestant work ethic or similar, which says if you're not working for an income, you are somehow substandard, you are a third class member of society, you are lazy, you don't deserve things. And that was probably a good way to motivate and structure society for most of history. But now that we have uh, automation, now that we have so much more technology, we should be looking towards a different goal, not full employment, but full unemployment, as Arthur C. Clarke famously said, the author of 2001. And so people would still be busy. People would still have many tasks uh, which would uh, occupy them, but they wouldn't be doing it in order to get paid. And how was this possible? Partly by universal basic income, but as the question indicated, there's a lot more that has to happen in parallel. The most important thing that I would highlight is driving down the costs of all the essentials for a good life. So that food becomes higher quality and cheaper, accommodation becomes higher quality and cheaper, education becomes free, healthcare becomes much more available. And we can do this if we truly grab a hold of the potential of existing technology. Rather than being afraid of it, Rather than saying, oh, people might lose their jobs, we should welcome that. And universal basic income, along with this drive towards what's sometimes called the Star Trek abundant economy, is, in my view, part of the route to a much better society, a society of sustainable superabundance. Thank you, David. Excellent. And, and definitely lines us up for a future topic around that whole notion of superabundance. So I think the, the, the fascinating thing about UBI is right now, uh, as you've heard, you know, there's, a, there's some great arguments for it. There are some well-trodden arguments being reeled out against it. There's a lot of policy challenges that need to be worked through. But I do wonder how different the picture will look a year down the road, uh, all depending on what the economic recovery programs look like. But will it become the case that actually there are countries starting to implement it in a year's time because they have no other option? Or will we have moved past the conversation again because we've had the kind of miraculous recovery that Donald Trump is predicting? Our third and final topic uh, for this afternoon session is really around how we improve human resilience. And David is going to talk about that. And David, for my first question, uh, I'd, I'd really like you to talk about the idea of what is it we can do to improve human resilience, physical and mental, not just during the crisis, but perhaps more importantly, in the, in the next couple of years as we get out of the crisis and we realize the bigger set of challenges that we're facing across society. Well, I see a number of very important enhancements to human nature that we should be considering. They're certainly improving our physical nature. We already do uh, improve our physical nature by having vaccinations from time to time. That's giving us a stronger immune system. Vaccines aren't actually very popular from a commercial point of view. Companies that spend a lot of money developing vaccines rarely get their investment back, which is why we've made little progress with that. But I believe that uh, with public direction, with the government uh, funding, with a common spirit, we can uh, accelerate uh, general purpose vaccines in a way that hasn't been possible before. That's sort of the simplest uh, aspect that we can improve our physical resilience. But then there's our mental resilience and our emotional resilience. And I think particularly the state of poor mental health is already a growing crisis and the COVID lockdown might propel it even more importantly. WHO had already forecast that depression would be the number one contributor of healthcare budgets around the world by 2030. 
in England and Wales between the, for men between the ages of, I think, 18 and 40. Suicide, an aspect of uh, poor mental health, is already the largest single cause of death. So we've seen these growing trends, and we've sort of been a bit slow at reacting to them. And I think now with the additional pressures of lockdown, we're likely to see more people becoming even more disturbed, partly by living with family members very close for long times. We love our family members, but they sometimes can rub us up the wrong way. And also with the risks of financial worries and so forth. So it's even more important that we address our emotional resilience. And people have had ideas for a long time, things like yoga or prayer or meditation, proper diets. I think we need to do a lot more, a lot more quickly. There is a very interesting community called the trans tech community, transformational technology, that's looking at things like careful use of applications, careful use of psychedelic drugs, careful use of hypnosis, and lots of other things that might make us more emotionally resilient. And frankly, if we are not more emotionally resilient, we are likely collectively to take lots of bad decisions. Why do many people vote for crazy politicians? It's because we are fearful, it's because we are depressed, and we are very clever, many of us, but we use our cleverness to justify emotionally foolish choices. So these are all reasons to accelerate the focus, not just on more vaccines to make us immune to a biological contagion, but a, if you can call it emotional vaccines to make us immune from uh, anger and depression. Thank you. It would certainly be fascinating to see whether any country down that went down the route of psychedelics, uh, you know, who would be the first national leader to suggest uh, an ayahuasca trip for everyone as the first action after the, the lockdown? Uh, I can't imagine many going that route. Um, okay, let's, let's move on now. I mean, you're a big fan of the whole notion of human engineering and uh, transhumanism. What, what could human engineering bring to the party in terms of impu improving our future resilience? So I do believe we can look at the makeup of the human being. We can modify ourselves genetically in due course. I'm not just talking about designer babies. I'm talking about tweaking our own genetics by various viral mechanisms, which can mean changing our genetics or more easily changing our epigenetics, which is which genes are turned on and turned off. And it already seems to be the case that practices such as meditation and yoga and breathing do alter our epigenetics already, and we need to understand how that works more. But I'm not to just focus on changing the individuals. I believe a lot of our physical problems, a lot of our emotional and uh, reasoning problems are social rather than just individual. And so I'm certainly open to looking at whatever the best solution is. So in terms of our irrationality, which sadly we have often, often we jump to the wrong conclusions, we're not very good on probabilistic reasoning. We are distracted by all kinds of so-called cognitive biases. For, with, for that, there's a role for better uh, cognitive awareness, teaching more people critical thinking at the individual level, possibly apps that help monitor what people are seeing and flag up in real time the fake news and unreliability of various uh, conspiracy theories but also I'm looking to what can be done socially, that there might be wise judgments by various uh, social media companies not to give undue prominence to conspiracy theories, which are already known with good confidence to be misleading or unhelpful. So these are three fields in which humanity could be improved, our physical robustness, our intellectual and rational robustness, our emotional state. We could also look perhaps at to what extent we are overly tribal, overly partisan. That was a, something that served us well, probably in ancient pre-evolutionary times, when probably we should be more fearful of people who look differently from us, but that tendency is no longer helpful today. And many of the daft things that people say or do online is driven by an undue tribalism. And if we could undo that part of human nature and make us more overall universal and uh, solid, have solidarity with humanity, I think that would be good too. 
And finally, there's a question, are we too consumerist? Are we too focused on conspicuous consumption? That's been a core part of our nature for a long time too. I think we should look at all things that will free us from this tendency to spend, spend, spend. We should look instead at things that will make us more content with experiences and relationships rather than trying belatedly and foolishly to keep up with the Joneses. Fantastic set of ideas there. The, the, the question that that leaves me though is, is whether much of this conversation ends up about being about those with money and what those with money and, and access to resources can do. Is, is there a risk that all of the human enhancement augmentation engineering debate bypasses a large number of people on the planet who simply don't have the money to buy those kinds of in, you know, benefits for themselves? So yes, there is such a risk. And there are two ways in which that risk can be addressed. One is by the action of the free market, which has a history of driving down costs for some things okay, when there's sufficient competition and sufficient scale. I look at the remarkable cheap prices of uh, powerful smartphones these days, which are much lower in real terms than myself and my colleagues 15, 20 years ago imagined could ever be the case, when at that stage people thought that smartphones were just for rich business people or yuppies. So the free market is one solution, but it doesn't always work. In some parts of the world, uh, the healthcare prices have diverged and things are more expensive now, like insulin uh, treatments in America than in the past. So the other thing we need is good politics. We need politicians acting on the co collective uh, desire to say certain things should be subsidized, certain things should be given away for free. After all, we don't charge people to receive vaccinations, thank goodness. And there are other things that governments may need to accelerate in order that everybody benefits. It's a bit like the network operators realize that would be in everybody's interest with smartphones if they subsidize the price for a while uh, in order to boost the amount of time online. Well, in a similar way, there are many reasons for enlightened governments to subsidize these human enhancements so that we collectively stop doing so many stupid things to each other and to ourselves. Fantastic. Uh, these conversations could go on for so much longer, but I, I, again, in the interest of time, I'm going to ask David Wortley to put up the, your, your um, poll question. Um, and let's see what everyone has to say on this one. Again, let's just take 30 seconds to answer this. So which of these areas should we avoid out of a fear that we might end up with worse humanity rather than better humanity? Or do you think that all of these engineering projects deserve support? Let's just take a few seconds to cast your votes. And David Wortley, if you could uh, pop the results up on screen that we have so far. Mr. Wood, would you like to comment? Well, one comment is on a point that Max uh, Ramashoy has just made. He's been making a whole lot of good comments on the chat. He says that human enhancements are worth nothing if everybody gets them. And I totally disagree. Sure, there are some things that uh, depend on one person being better than another. If you just make everybody taller, if you realize that tall people tend to get better jobs in or better choices of uh, intimate partners, then uh, that's a relative good. Uh, but there are many other things which is good for the whole society if everybody improves. So if we are all smarter, if we are all more compassionate, it's not just a few who will benefit, everybody will benefit. So I do like the fact that uh, almost everybody has uh, selected or the majority have selected all the above re-engineering projects deserve support. I suspect if we'd had a longer discussion about some of the drawbacks of some of these things, people might have been a bit more uh, mixed in the reactions because each of these uh, fields does have some dangers. After all, if you have vaccines that go wrong, you can have many worse problems and similarly with the other fields. But because the discussion, I think rightly focused on the upsides of these interventions, if done wisely, 
I'm happy with that uh, response. Okay, can I just remind people that there are some fantastic comments popping up, but they're only coming to the panel. You need to make sure you select all panelists and participants as the option uh, to make sure that everyone sees your incredibly good thoughts. Uh, for our first question, David, um, I'm going to take a question by my former boss, Rick Henshaw, um, which, well, I assume it's the same one, um, which is, and, and to apply it both to the transhumanism or human engineering piece, but also more generally, uh, will the surge in nationalism make it impossible for the world to make a coordinated and coherent recovery from the pandemic, leaving us with a patchwork nation first approach? And, and I guess what I'm saying is, could we extend that to how nations approach transhumanism or human engineering? Could it be the case that those with the most wealth or the most desire to pull away from the pack do this for themselves as a means of enhancing their competitiveness as a nation? rather than something as they see as being a benefit to the whole of humanity. So David, let's start you off and then we'll bring in Lair and Anne to comment on that question as well. It is a great question. Normally we say there are advantages in competition and there are also advantages in collaboration and knowing how to get the balance is key. My company Symbian had the motto of, of uh, collaborate before competing and we had the uh, main uh, mobile phone uh, companies Nokia, Ericsson and Motorola collaborating on the creation of an operating system before they competed with the apps. Anyway, on the particular point, I think this is a case when we must balance more towards collaboration rather than competition. The dangers are that uh, a few company, countries who decide to be more loose, who have a more casual approach to health and safety, if they go it alone, we can have all kinds of drawbacks. So there's the reason to focus more on collaboration. Will we get it? It's still up in the air. If we look at how we came out of the First World War, compare we came out how we came out of the Second World War. We came out of the First World War badly. We came up with a punitive, vindictive set of agreements which set, sowed the seeds for much worse to come in the future. We came out of the Second World War, equally a global uh, tragedy, but with more of a public-minded attitude. The victorious powers helped to invest in the vanquished powers with the Marshall Plan, the United Nations, the World uh, Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and later the WHO was set up and given more powers. I think that in the current crisis, we must uh, look to people all around the world to realize, hey, the collaborative route, though difficult, is the one that really needs attention but we can't take it for granted. We're gonna need people all around the world pushing for it to make it happen. Thank you, David. And let's bring in Lair first on the same question. And, and just generally your thoughts on the human engineering uh, issue. Yes. Um, so thank you very much, David, for all of these insights on, on enhancing humans. To be honest, well, I have a lot of thoughts coming up and, and a lot of questions, I think, but I think my main doubt with, um, with this would be, so why would we want to enhance, especially the cognitive and, and emotional aspects of humans, um, if, if we know that emotions have actually um, uh, their functional um, role in, in, you know, in, in our bodies and, and they're, you know, they're meant for survival. So why would we want to enhance, suppress some of these emotions and some of these even, even cognitive biases have their, their function and their roles, right? So why would we want to do this instead of tackling the sources of, let's say, toxic uh, emotions and, and, you know, mental uh, issues like depression and so on? So what, what would be your take on this? We have to do whatever is most effective and certainly often it is the best thing to tackle the sources in the environment. The fact that there's so much inequality it does drive emotional distress. People losing their jobs with little idea about where their next income is going to come from. Or in America, many people realizing that their children will probably earn less than they do, that's causing them great grief. And we are seeing more and more deaths of despair, to use the terminology of husband and wife, Princeton, the economists, uh, Angus Dayton and Anne Case. So we should not just focus on what we can do at the individual level. Absolutely, we need a broad perspective. But where there are things that can be done individually, we should do it. So we've always had education in place to try and help people's reasoning ability. Perhaps we can do more. And we have always taught people some discipline of emotional self-control. Not that we think emotions are wrong, but we think that they do need to be somehow 
managed so that when we do lose control, we do it in the right way rather than being victim to inner demons in the language of uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln. And any final thoughts either on the, this particular topic or generally on what we've been discussing today? Because I'm, I'm going to have to wrap us up in a minute uh, in the interest of time. Well, thank you so much, David. I enjoyed um, absolutely hearing about how we can enhance our, our mental states. M my question is very much in line with, with Lara's. Uh, you know, so there's like two components to it. Uh, there's this, uh, your, your inner sense or like the, the, the your own personal, be, your own locus. And then there's the exogenous factors that might influence your, your depression. So I've been following mental health quite a bit with respect to the younger generations because um, young people are undergoing, you know, unprecedented level of not only uh, mental health issues, and it's not just the, um, the fact that we diagnose it more, but suicides are up as well. So, so there really is a growing, it really is a growing problem. But again, I, I agree with this uh, notion that an emotion, a, a feeling, a pain, a sensation is, is our body's warning signal that something is wrong. So I'm looking at a lot of these exogenous factors, these, uh, these external um, uh, uh, causes. And obviously when you I have a, a data set actually that I run multi uh, varied regressions on regularly and I just add attributes and I have um, I have a divided it by county level so you can compare county to county and see where do you have the highest late rates of depression now obviously correlation and causation is not the same but what you do see is that it's you know typically areas that have uh, high unemployment high substance abuse high um, uh, low education. So it really goes along those factors. So my question would be just the fact that you can sort of alter your mood or just, will we possibly get to a situation that if that becomes available and that trickles down even on, uh, to, to become affordable, will we individualize that problem? Will we make it so that if you have a mental health issue, that's your problem? That is not the society around you, but that's you. It's on the onus is on you to fix it. So that that would be my question: is 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 are we bypassing a much bigger problem by by looking at um, making it a personal one? That's a fantastic question, but unfortunately, David, you're not going to get to answer it this time, simply because we we're, we're we're running right up against the clock. David has a book that he's showing us. Um, all of the panelists are kindly sharing some resources that we'll send out in a follow up email. Uh, and, and you'll be able to see their books and everything on their LinkedIn profiles. Um, but I just want to say thank you to everyone. I'm not going to do a massive summing up. I think it's been a fascinating conversation across the topics we've covered. It's highlighted a, an equal raft of topics we could cover in the future. Uh, and on that note, um, before I close out, David Worley, could we get the final polling question up? Just to really help us think about what we might cover next. Can we just get the polling question up? Uh, just take 10 seconds to really tell us, you know, pick a topic that you think um, that you would like to see covered in a future session, or if you want something else, put it in the comments section. While you're voting, I'm just going to thank again Anne, Lara and David for giving so generously of their time and their ideas and their passion in this conversation. It's been fascinating. Uh, I've often forgotten that I'm meant to be the moderator and I've just been so lost in what they've been saying that it's been really uh, mind expanding for me and, and very, very um, challenging as well in terms of thinking about how do we as a society really start to move forward on these on the different agendas that they've been talking about okay mr wortley if you could put the results up okay so governance and government and the environment and sustainability seem to be the top two excellent okay well and then can we get the final um uh powerpoint slides up just as a, a way of saying goodbye
Okay, just a reminder, we, we have this book coming out um, on really, you know, trying to look beyond the current crisis, get your cameras out, take a picture. Um, the chapter submissions have to be in by midnight Pacific time on Sunday, which is 8 a.m. in the UK, Monday morning. Uh, and we will literally switch off the, um, the submission form after that. Uh, no, please, that the dog ate your homework, that you got you missed the bus or anything else if you get your chapter in great we have some incredible chapters in already from people that i would never have imagined would have had time to write for us uh but i'm blown away and it already looks like we might have two books worth of, of material we may not publish two but we're certainly going to have at least two books worth uh david can we get the second slide up uh next webinar um we, next week we're going to be looking at um, a specific industry that has possibly been the hardest hit of, uh, you know, of all or amongst the hardest hit, which is air transport. Uh, so we're going to have representatives from the airlines and the airports uh, talking to us and we'll be sharing the results of the research we've been doing uh, around the economic and social impacts of um, the, the pandemic on the industry. And, and the, the, the webinar link for that will go out uh, in the next day or so. And finally, the closing side, um, the tell our children and uh, all the members of our team still need to be fed. So if you feel like uh, making a contribution, A, you can get our newsletter for free because um, we want to give something back. But B, uh, if you want to buy any of our books, then um, you can get a 25% discount. And again, grab a picture, share it with your friends and tell the world about this. Uh, and we'll, we have a program of events planned now for the coming weeks. So keep your eyes open. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you so much to the panelists for making this such a fascinating afternoon and uh, go well everyone and enjoy the future.